Hey everybody, welcome to the Purpose People podcast. Today I've got a friend, MJ, from Signable, and we're going to talk about the unconventional path to purpose, a little bit about data and that kind of stuff, and um, just explore how he started life doing it one way and now he's doing what he believes is the thing that really gets him up in the morning. So welcome. Thank you very much for having me here. So um, when we're talking about your journey so far, do you want to just share to everybody a little bit about what you're doing now, and then we can explore how you got there. Yeah, of course. So right now um, I work at Signable, which is a provider of e-signatures. And in Signable, I am the business data manager, uh, analyst. Yeah. And as a business data analyst, I look at all the data that comes in in the business. Um, I see which team can use it the best and what they can use it for, give them more insight to do their job better than what they used to do. Yeah. And um, it's, it's a bit, little bit of a everything and everywhere job. Um, I talk with everyone, every single team I'm in contact with. Um, even though the job title says business data analyst, yeah. I'm next to analyzing, I do a little bit of um, data science, if you can call it. I work with machine learning tools and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, I, I code quite a bit, um, trying to get more out of data and different APIs working together. And um, we also try out different tools and I, we try to engineer new things and new, new pieces of software so teams can work better um, yeah. with the data that we have. Um, so yeah, that's what I do. Um, and that's, that's what, where I'm right now in Signable. Which is quite interesting, Benigi, you quite a sociable guy, quite outgoing, like to have a laugh or whatever. And yet most people's perception of data analysts and people that work in code rather be under stairs, you know, in a cupboard with a glow mm -hmm. coming from there, being left alone by people. So your job by definition determines that there is that data side, but you don't forget the people. It's, uh, it's really interesting at, um, at work, we do this personality profile thing. And um, most data people would traditionally be in, in the blue color. You have like four colors, blue, yellow, green, and red. Is that, that disc? Is that a disc, that? yeah. yeah disc. Or we, we call it the CME profile. Okay. It has loads of different names, but yeah, yeah. blue is like the detail oriented. But very often those people are a little bit more introverted and maybe a bit people shy. Yeah. And when new people join the company, I'm like, so you've just done the test. What do you think of that? And they're like, oh, you're definitely blue, definitely. like. There's uh, even on the test, it shows that my blue actually goes a little bit in the negative. <laughs> it's crazy. So what, what color are you? Um, it, it, it shifts between yellow, red, where it's like more okay. like um, leadership and then like just going on or um, yellow, green, where it's more like a little bit laid back and let's just see what happens. It's going to be all right. Um, and I tend to flip between that anyway. But yellow is the, is the dominant color, which is just outgoing, creative, um, happy to talk with people and very yeah, optimistic yeah, about yeah. everything. So my understanding of the yellow, green is more, they're more people, more creative as a general rule. Red are a bit more purpose-driven as in, you know, um, this is the goal, we're going to go after it and quite decisive, Yeah, you know, and I think misconception is most people think, oh, if to be a leader, you've got to be red, but mm. isn't the case. Um, you know, and that's looking at data, right? So the mm. data is, oh, well, because it stacks so heavily in one favor, then it might, to be a leader, you must be red. And it's not always the case. Sometimes the best leaders are actually introverted mm. because they seem to take a little bit more time to digest the situation and circumstances mm. and maybe back the decision making up by facts. So it's quite, quite interesting. So, but you obviously, let's say 16 years old or maybe younger, mm -hmm. didn't think that maybe not have been your number one career choice. Would Mate, that be a fair estimate? If you talk with me back then, my main thing was like, I want to work somewhere where I am difficult to be replaced. Yeah. Um, so I want to work with people because yeah. with people, you have a personal relationship. If you have a day off and someone else comes in, they don't have that same relationship as in where in an office job, um, you can do your stuff fine and well and work really hard. If you have a day off, someone else comes, comes in, they may do your job better. Yeah. And you don't want to be re replaceable um, in that sense. Yeah. Um, hence why I went, I went on to do a social cultural work degree. Um, okay. by, the, by the age I was 16, I started that. Um, which turns out to be an app, like in my case, some people thrive in it and do really well. But in my case, it was absolutely worthless degree. <laughs> I never had any job as a youth worker. Um, did a little bit of volunteering here and there, yeah. but never made anything of a career with it. Just so then, so, so obviously, how did, you, how did you make that transition then? Was it that you were thinking something's not adding up, I'm not enjoying it? You know, was it deeper questions? Did you just take a job and just try and... How, how did you come to the conclusion that 
this wasn't for you. And then what did you do well, as a result of that? First of all, I was applying for jobs left, right, and center. Yeah. Um, but it, it just wasn't the right, um, the right job level. So what happened before that? Um, when I was 14, now maybe we're going to take a little bit of a darker turn, but I was, when I was 14, my sister passed away. Okay. And um, it was just at the time at school where, so in the Netherlands, I, I was raised in the Netherlands, for those who didn't catch on to the accent. Um, you have three different levels of high school education. And um, at the year where I was, we just had to choose which one of the levels I was going to do. Mm -hmm. And I could choose the, the easiest level and just kind of like, free wheel through school and it will be fine, but let's just focus on yourself first. Yeah. I could pick, or I could pick like the slightly harder, the middle level, which would have meant that I would have had to put more effort into school and really be studious and just get the results to, to go to the next years. Um, and me and my parents decided to, it's, it's easy just to go for the lower one and just take, take some time. Um, don't stress about school. You have, yeah, you yeah. You've had enough on your plate. Yeah. yeah. Um, which was like looking back a really good choice. Yeah. Um, and, and I respect my parents for giving me that advice. Um, however, at the end of those four years, I could have made the decision to go on and do that harder um, bit um, and just on a shortened cycle. Yeah. I um, mean, that, that's a very common path that people do in the Netherlands. Yeah. Um, but I decided, no, screw that. I'm done with school. I just want to go to uni, do like three, four years, and then I'm done. I'm never going to touch school again because I, I, I don't like to study. Mm. Um, hence why I ended up with a, with a social cultural degree. Yeah. And um applying then for jobs, which weren't like completely suited to the, to the degree that I had, or um, they asked for a higher um, education level, which I didn't have. Um, I just ended up at working for an agency and doing jobs from working in a concrete factory to working in an electronic shop yeah. to um, like, I think the two things that I haven't done is like door-to-door -door salesman and working in, um, uh, how do you call it? Restaurants and, okay. and bars yeah. and pubs and stuff like Service, that. Yeah. But everything else in between, I've I've, I've done um, until I landed a job in um, in a shop in the Netherlands, and I figured out that I quite liked sales okay. um, because it still had like the people thing in it, and um, it was like goal oriented because you had like KPIs and targets to hit, and you and the team you rally and you go for it and you sell and blah blah blah, um, and I really got into that. Mm. So um, I decided. Um, not really on a whim, but almost like taking like a reflection on the choice that I made when I was in high school and I had to make the choice between the easier or the harder level. Yeah. Like what is best for me right now? And I decided to take a few years um, of my life, move to England, do a, um, do a theology related course yeah. and um, really find out who I am and what I stand for. Yeah. Um, because I was raised as a Christian and especially in the whole situation with my sister, that was something that um, really got me through mm. um, those times. So I really found it important to focus on that. And then when I came back to whether it was England or the Netherlands, and I finished that degree to continue with sales and, and make something out of that. Yeah. So I spent three years in England um, and I moved back and I got this job in a bike shop in the Netherlands, super stereotype. Um, and within three, four months, I worked my way up to become shop manager, mm -hmm. um, which funnily, funny enough, my, all my English friends laugh about it. My job title in Dutch was Winkle manager. <laughs> 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 and it gives a lot of smiles when yeah, I tell yeah, the name. Yeah. Someone had to explain it to me that Winkle is not shop. At, yep. start, at the start of the show. It is, it's a thumbnail. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, no, I, I managed to become um, shop manager and I went from like a smaller shop to a bigger shop to like one of the top three shops in the Netherlands and it was all fantastic and I loved it. Um, and I thought right now is the time I want to do a degree um, and I want to do a degree part-time so I can still work in the shop here, but I can also upskill um, myself and, yeah. and my, my, uh, my education. Um, so I did that. I got all the, all the checks from work. Um, one day school on the Monday I went to school and then um, I worked Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, or Sunday, because we were open in the weekend. Yeah. Um, and that went all really well. And it was a um, marketing management course. And it was the closest thing that I could do in a part-time thing that would also touch on sales, because I thought sales is the thing. Yeah. And I was raised in like a really small village in the Netherlands. So imagine me cycling to high school. Mm. On the right of me, I have windmills. On the left of me, I have cows. And I can see wow. like the, the next villages because everything is flat from like the little like hill that I'm riding on. Yeah. Like that is like how I was raised. So we knew nothing about marketing. 
They yeah. know nothing about yeah. like new technologies, or at least I didn't know about it, you know? Yeah. Um, so in this course, we find out about marketing and, and digital marketing and how you can like work with like tools like Google and how that, that the whole ranking in Google is actually quite a competitive game and that you can um, do certain things on a website that makes you rank and a thing like Google Analytics. I'm like, dude, this is amazing. This is beautiful. Mm. Um, so I kind of start to find my way into, into marketing more. And now we've gone from like social cultural worker to doing everything I can to make some money to sales, to theology, to back in sales, and now going on to marketing. It's like this whole like unstructured path. Um, and I thought marketing is it. So I really started to focus on that. I, um, I ended my career at the, my, my job at the bike shop. Yep. And I got a job at uh, DeLonghi, you know, from the coffee machines. Yep. Um, they had an office in, um, in a city near, nearby. And I got a, a job offer there. And that was my first experience of marketing and I loved it. It was fantastic. Um, writing blogs, um, doing a little bit of advertising. It was really like one of those yeah, entry yeah. level jobs. You could do yeah. anything you want, writing emails, everything. Um, really good stuff to get your, um, get your hands dirty with. Mm. And th that's something I would recommend to everyone starting their career. Like take the, the widest possible job title ever because it just enables you to get so much different um, experiences from every single level. And then you can hone in what you really want. Yeah, yeah. And for me, what I really liked about digital marketing was um, Google Tag Manager, Google Analytics, and Google Ads. That little like trifecta mm. was where I was loving stuff. I could set up tags and I could track how the tags were doing and I could run ads and see how the ads were doing and really focus on the numbers. And you can kind of start to see like the shimmers into like, hey, numbers are like quite a thing. And I really liked yeah. that. And at school when we did like statistics and stuff like that, I really thrived in that. I really enjoyed like digging through those numbers, but I thought you can never get a job just doing formulas and stuff like that. So, <laughs> okay, marketing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And yeah, like things just continue. So that was, so you were doing this in Holland, yeah? Yeah. So at some point you left Holland and come back to the UK? Yes. So when I did my, um, my, my course in England, I um, started dating um, this amazing girl and I, I had to move back to the Netherlands, unfortunately, um, because there was just stuff moving with the family. Yeah. Um, but when I was in the Netherlands, um, I thought, you know what, I like this girl for a while, but she's actually really, really cool. Um, so we did, um, we had a long distance relationship for two years. Um, okay. And then I moved back to England in 2019 when I was in the, like the final few months of my uh, marketing management degree. Yeah. I moved to uh, England. I got a job at Signable. I got married to Nicole. Yeah. And um, we're still together and we're happy together. And we have a little son now as well. Yeah. Um, she already had a son who is also fantastic. Um, but there's also like a mix, like it, it, it kind of looks like nothing in my life has gone like just straight line. Yeah, like yeah, yeah. you meet someone in England, you go back to the Netherlands, you do two years of long distance relationship, then you come back to the, to England, then you marry. It's like, it's, it's just all like. But, but it's it, an unconventional way, but what you've ended up in is being in a much happier place than absolutely. where you were. Because the, the, the thing is, well, often I, spoke, I speak with Nicole about this. Um, I think why long distance relationship worked for us is we were so intentional with, with every single moment we could spend with each other's presence. So yeah. we, we just we just talked and talked and talked and really got to know each other. And then when we finally were together, and it's still like very often I look at it, I'm like, I'm just so happy to, to be with you. Yeah, be yeah. Because we can we spend time together and we really know each other. Um, and I feel that when, when I had like other relationships, when, when we were in the same country or in like the same like area, time you spend with each other is normal. And it's just like, yeah. And you don't really talk about like really important things. Yeah. And maybe also because I was a lot younger um, at those times. Yeah, but it's interesting because to some degree in a roundabout way, you've got the data. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, you, you spent a lot of time with, you know, Nicole, whatever, and you've ex exchanged loads of data. By definition, you actually come to, yeah, this is a right fit. Mm. Um, and obviously now you're married. So yeah. And obviously that data is now is multiplying because there's more of you. And, and, and the thing is, as a result of that, just indirectly, you've actually put the thing that you're doing into practice in your personal life as well as in your, in your work life. Yeah. So just explain to me then. So you talk about all these tools and the statistics and stuff like that. You know, Google's always changing its algorithms yeah. and stuff like this. How do you stay on top of it all? Because it moves so quickly. 
Um, so obviously you have like the newsletters and like LinkedIn and I try to kind of stay away from Twitter, but Twitter is sometimes handy to get like so, some, some things. Crazy in. place, Twitter. Yeah. Um, so I really try to follow like some, some thought leaders in like, for instance, search engine and stuff like that. And yeah. very often when, um, at Signable, we have quite a culture of, of sharing information with everybody. And, um, if for instance, I see something, Hey, this is changing in Google analytics because, um, I checked their like update page because J4 is, is launching and every week they launch like a new feature or a, yeah. a new per parameter or whatever. Um, I share it with the marketing channel. If the marketing channel finds something and they're like, Oh, this is really cool. Um, everybody look at this. Um, everybody just shares everything with everybody. Um, no, that's good. So it, it's very, very much, um, organically that we learn, um, what is new and what is happening. Yeah. Um, I think it has to be that way because you know, um, you can't, you, you can't be a silo and you can't learn it all either. Well, the thing is like, I am, I'm, I'm the business data analyst. I'm not the marketing data analyst. Yeah. I'm not the customer data analyst. I, yeah. I go over the entire business and I look at like the, um, because I'm the only guy, uh, at the moment. Um, I do like function in all these other teams, but the ideal situation is that you have one guy dedicated to marketing, one guy dedicated to yeah. customer, one guy dedicated to sales, whatever. Um, but at the moment I, I kind of do all of that. Yeah, um, you, but you, I guess you've got, you've got a lot of the data now, what's working, what's not working, which are the insights that you need to make decisions by. Mm -hmm. And I think for me, that's, that's what's great about having data. You know, is it working? Is mm -hmm. what we're doing working? And you can actually back it up with facts. Mm. You know, I think for me, when we started doing content marketing, we, you know, it was like, we know the content's right, but how do we create the engagement? And so one of the things that we did was my own personal LinkedIn has turned it to creator mode and then done the LinkedIn newsletters. Mm -hmm. You know, so we're using the same content, but now it's got more of a reach. So sometimes it can be, the content could be right, but not necessarily knowing the platforms and the programs can hold you back as well. Mm -hmm. And I think the fact that you've got that um, ability to share information is you're maximizing both. Mm. You're seeing if it works, but you're also sharing the knowledge to see, are we doing the best we can with the technology mm. that's out there? I mean, for me, you know, is 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 Google the only area that you look at? Do you look at social media as well, or, or? so? Personally, what I what I'm at the moment really really looking at is just like total overarching business metrics. Um, yeah. So Google is really important, um, and that we grow in that is really important. But I I have to put my trust in the marketing team to find ways to grow in that. Yeah. Um, and uh, what I do, I make sure that they can track that in an easy way. Yep. I make sure that they can follow what's happening on, on their domain in a really easy way. Mm -hmm. um, see how many people sign up, how many people um, start a subscription or make a purchase. Um, but what I'm at the moment really looking at is like, how can we enrich this data that we have? So for instance, we have all these different companies that we work with, but we have um, no idea which industry they're from, right. which, yeah. is, which is quite a big gap. Because if we know which industry people are, are in, we can see who do we speak to the most? Who yeah. do we stick with the most? Well, it forms marketing, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So um, I, I developed this, um, like with, so Uber released this like machine learning platform called Ludwig and in Ludwig you can um, upload a set of data and it will learn that data and then you can apply that, that deep learning algorithm onto a new set of data. So for instance, to, I, I thought, well, to figure out a, an industry of someone, you can like in most cases, with the exceptions there, look at the company name and figure out what their industry is. Yeah. For instance, Joe's Plumbing is not a marketing agency. It's a plumbing business. Yeah. And Bob's Letting is a letting agent. And that is not, um, I don't know, an elderly home, whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so I got this like big list of like, I don't know, 200,000, 2 million company names and industries, gave it to the algorithm, it trained on that. It took bloody ages to train. But when it, when it was done, I yeah. released that onto the database that Signable had. And all of a sudden I could present to the company, hey, um, in this industry, each customer generates about four times more revenue, revenue than the average customer. So if people like this come in, get on them, this is what their seasonality looks like. It wow. really looks like in this month, everybody who signs up almost converts. So like reel them in then, because that's your time to, yeah. to harvest. Maybe the months before that, we want to sow some seeds and get in front of people's yeah. uh, face. Um, and really bring that storyline, uh, storytelling aspect into the business. Yeah, yeah. Um, figure out what, um, another thing that, I, that I'm, I'm busy with is like figuring out 
cost per acquisition divided by lifetime value, what's that ratio? Yeah, yeah. And you want to get that ratio to three because then you're growing and you're growing rapidly. But if you're going too too high, you want to spend more money into marketing or into sales to get that number down because you know there's that that space to invest. If you're under it, you maybe want to look at some different things. Do you have a good product market fit? Just big metrics like that that really show where a business is going and what direction a business is is, is doing. So, so your technology because it's 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 out there in various different forms. You, yeah. Basically, just for the the viewers, essentially, signable is creating digital signatures on contracts or, yeah. or whatever it may be. So, whatever you would sign naturally with a pen, you're signing digitally. So, obviously, there are you're not the first per, not first person to do it what makes signable different I don't, this isn't a product thing but you mm -hmm. know just so people can understand the way it works and so for the uk what makes it really unique for the uk is that we have a uk support team um so if you call um i think with the most recent stats within like 10 minutes you have someone on the phone or you have a response in the email like they're really on it of yeah. course within office hours yeah um so that's a really big thing um we have quite a unique pricing point where um, other um, companies, they charge per user. Right. We charge per envelope sent. So yeah. let's say you have a letting agency and you have, um, I don't know, 10 different offices all over the country and each office has 70 users. Yeah. You can add all 70 users, it doesn't really matter. Mm. Where with other companies, each user is like, I don't know, 10 or 20 quid a month. Yeah. Um, we just check like, hey, how many envelopes do you send? And that's how we charge you. And then if you go over it, there's still overages and we're not going to cut you off, obviously. Yeah. Um, another thing that we have is that the API is uh, is free of use. Okay. Um, so you don't have to pay extra for that. It's really simple. Documentation is really clear. Um, and we're just like, and this is the thing every company says, of course, but like we're always developing and improving. There are like so many things in the pipeline right now. We have product things that, held, that are held internally in the company and every week or every, every two weeks, they're just so many new things that are coming that are in the pipelines that are developing on um yeah because yeah. it's, it's an interesting market because i remember that when when it first come out oh you ca you can't sign it you know it was like no you, it doesn't work and it's like well we can work if it's digitally recognized and you know certainly with my accountant for example we use signable so you know when i come to the end of approving a VAT return or whatever it is we use signable to do it it's very quick very simple mm. and very easy to get it out there but i think what what's interesting about the company that you work for is uh, they they almost feel like like a tech company Mm -hmm. You know, they're not just like, oh, we just do signatures. There's that, there's that whole buzz, there's a whole environment and stuff like this. So what's happened with COVID? How's the team adapted? Are the team now working in the office? Are they working remotely or is it a mixture of both? What's the, cause you've got a tech product that mm -hmm. re removed the person sign in and it's almost like it's come back on you now because the whole world it has changed as well. So how do, how do you guys work? So it, actually like the whole working from home lockdown situation, Obviously, it was a, everybody had to change for that, but it yeah. was not as drastic of a change for us. No. Um, we all work from laptops. We all had the option to work from home before already. Yeah. Um, so it just meant that instead of the option to work from home, you have to work from home and you can't come <laughs> yeah. into the office. Yeah. Um, but with that, it was really good. We have uh, yearly events where, for instance, with, with Christmas or like we have the what we call the domies, uh, mm -hmm. which is our like internal um, award show where we recognize people who have done really well in, in like the last year on different categories. Yeah. Um, and we held the domies digitally and stuff like that. And it was all really fun. We got like little care packages through the post and things like that. Nice. Um, and they really took care of us in, in that way. Um, and then once the office opened up again, I think I think that's maybe one of the challenges internally right now to get people back into the office and get it back into like a habit of, hey, let's get together and let's get more collaboratory. Because what I found out when I got back into the office again after like quite a while, I was like, there's almost like a sigh of relief because instead of um, going in Slack and sending someone a message and kind of knowing that I'm kind of probably like bothering their workflow because it's like quite disruptive and like yeah, a pop-up comes on the screen. Yeah. But I'm like, hey, um, can you have a look at this? Because I, I think this could apply to your team, but I'm not really sure. Can you have a look? And they're like, yeah, sure. Go and have a look. Yeah. And yeah. that is that's really valuable. Um, you do you do miss it. I mean, we've made, we've even creation, our agency, we made a big step because we've gone fully remote, but we have to now build in that time of gathering the people together. And, you know, that it, it is a different mindset. It's something to learn. And already we're, we're, we're experiencing the pain and that journey of how to get everybody in the same place and this sort of stuff. So I, you know, in the past, you know, the whole click over the soldiers, because it's quite a collaborative environment, I think in the creative environment, mm -hmm. 
I've always said, you know, if you're doing anything creative, get together anyway. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe don't sit, try and do a creative thing on Zoom because it's not great. Maybe the team comes together, the, the three people who are involved in the project go somewhere and spend some time and come up with the idea. And I, even historically, I think we'd always change the environment when we got a creative brief. Mm. We literally leave the office anyway. Mm -hmm. So like the team, I, teams I used to work in, we literally just wouldn't work in the office. It's like, where are you? Oh, you're off out again. Well, yeah, we are because this isn't very creative. And every time we're there, we're being bugged. So mm -hmm. let's go and find a different space. So I think there is that element there, but I, I do get you where the fact is you've got that personal connection where, oh, you know, you're developing stuff. And there's, I guess it's collaboration, isn't mm. it? It's understanding how to make that work yeah. with one another. So in terms of data then, because obviously everyone talks about data and, 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 you know, data, data is just like gold nowadays, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It's like, it's the new gold, we're trading data. And, and mm -hmm. so what, what do you, what do you feel is the, what are the biggest opportunities you have looking at data today? Well, what, what, what would be the advantages of having someone like you in their team? It, it's so dependent on the business. Mm. So, um, to, to take a step, a few steps back, like it's signable. I was doing the, like the marketing and like the Google ads. I kind of started to specialize in that. And at a point I came to, um, to a moment where I was like, Hey, I have questions that I can't answer. And I don't know where, where to get like more information from. Um, we're spending X amount of Google, uh, on Google ads and we're getting this back, but I don't know if it's really working. If those people that that sign up, if they go, or if they go and pay or make a purchase, or what's going on with that? Mm -hmm. And I didn't know how to implement it. I didn't know how to get the data. I know that data was probably living somewhere, but yep. how to link that together? Um, so I brought that that issue to the marketing team, and they're like, "Well, we don't know either." Um, but want to go and figure it out. So um, one thing led to another. I got given the opportunity to to work as a uh, marketing analyst for a few months. Um, and if that was proven successful, then I, we would have another chat and eventually we got some, some things working and we got like a few first, like when I look back on it right now, it looked horrible. It was really like amateur level, but Hey, guess what? I wasn't amateur. Um, yeah. and it, it didn't look great at all, but it, we got some value out of it mm -hmm. and the ball started rolling and people like woke up more like, Hey, this is maybe like something that we need in the business right now. Yeah. Because you can't, if you don't have a lot of data, you don't really need a data analyst because mm. there's not much to analyze or there's not much to do. But you could argue there is data, but we just necessarily, there, there is a lot of data that happens in the day to day, but we don't track it necessarily True. or see it as valuable. And True. I think that obviously you've started to spot that there was a bit of a gap where yeah. I don't know was the, the stock answer. And you're like, no, no, there's, there's got to be a better way. Yeah. And you've carved. And yeah, it's like that MVP, you know, journey where we start small and see if it works and, grow and scale it. And would you say now with the whole data thing, is that quite a big driver now between the decisions for the company? Oh, it, it like, I hate tooting my own horn about stuff like this, but it has like revolutionized how we do business. Like there are people in the customer team that like they use dashboards that I've made and they would like, it would be detrimental to their job and their performance if that dashboard wasn't there anymore, if we yeah. would remove that right now. And it's um, very much that people are really enthusiastic about the data that we have and how it's presented. And I have a lot of, um, you can call them like data cheerleaders in the company because yeah. they're like, dude, this stuff makes me perform better, which then also makes me perform better, which if we have like, I don't know, a review and like, hey, how, how are you pro progressing in your job and responsibilities and things like that, like it propels them in how they're doing and how their career is going. Yeah. So it's just a win-win for everyone. The company is having employees who are more productive and getting more out of their like eight hours a day. The people that do the job feel more satisfaction because they do their job better and easier and quicker um, instead of like pulling six spreadsheets together and like trying to link individual lines together. It's just bloop, in one dashboard and it automatically loads with the newest data. They don't have to like yeah. extract anything. It just goes. Um, and we, we try to like make something like that for each and each and every team. And we're getting to a point now where we, where we get like those, those, um, cost per acquisition and, and lifetime value ratios in and like other big and not, metrics. And, and not every, you know, like not everybody drills that deeply into the data. And I think with technically with the company that you are, you need this information. Because, Absolutely. Because you're spending money on social, you're spending, you, you've got users in different sectors regularly using this product and you've got it at scale as well. Mm. You're not dealing with like five clients. You could be dealing with tens of thousands of clients, loads, tens of yeah. thousands of signatures and stuff like that. So data plays a data mm. plays a key role. And I think 
the important thing that you said there was about dashboards. You know, uh, dashboards are a great way of, or great tool that I think is just emerging now. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like for CEOs or business owners, it's like, oh, give me a dashboard. Well, I, well, what do I put in that dashboard? But it's being able to see something at a glance to make quick decisions, mm-hmm. but it's accurate data that you're presenting. I think there is definitely definitely a call for it and as you said mm. it's changed the business fundamentally but there are other industries that need that service mm. as well you know and right now we're getting to the point where there are so many dashboards that we have like a bit of a of a seesaw thing where people ask hey can i get an extra dashboard for this but then on the other side people are like there's so many dashboards i don't know what is saying what where, where do the i dashboard go of dashboards yes um so that that's a whole new journey now. Where like it's a whole new problem because it's it's things that we have never experienced before. Yeah, yeah. And um, and it like it it is actually like a luxury problem right now. Yeah. Like there's too much data and cool. You no, know, we just simplify. So it you went we, from not enough to too much, which is yeah. which is interesting. Which is an easier problem to solve yeah, because yeah, you yeah. just consolidate a few dashboards and you streamline a few things and um, it's a, it's a really interesting thing. Sometimes um, I got given this advice. If um, you just remove a chart, you just don't talk about it anymore. Just remove it. See if someone complains about it. Yeah. If in eight weeks no one complains about it, they don't need it. Yeah. They don't need it at all. Um, and if they want it, cool, just put it back because it doesn't take that much time <laughs> to put it back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But like, I'm like, well, oh, that's actually really good because sometimes people ask data, but do they need that data? Yeah. And very often it's more like, I, I want to have that, but there's not, not a, like a specific- Well, if it's, not, if it's not generating an informed decision, then there's mm. no point in having it, right? Yeah. But if it does add valuable insight to make better decisions, then of course it's got to be there. But you're right, you know, some data is just, we're comfortable and mm-hmm. we just need it. Well, why yeah. do you need it? Well, I don't know, but okay. So you're asking those questions to s- simplify and streamline the process. And mm. I think tech gets complex very quickly. So- the skill is simplifying that tech on a regular basis, you know? Yeah. So talk about, so you, this is your career. You've been um, doing this data stuff as a, this is, this is who you are. You're a data analyst. Yeah. What would you, what would you say to someone who was in your shoes at 16? Would you say just do the same thing as you did or would you advise them differently? Uh, that's a very tricky question. Um, if I, if I look at myself right now, mm. um, I think that the, the skills that I've picked up along the way actually complement each other really well. So um, I- imagine this as like a triangle, yeah? And it has like yeah. two curves and it comes together as like a very narrow point. Yeah. The top of that point are the best people in the industry. Yeah. And the further down you go and the more general the knowledge gets, the um, not best the people get. Um, yeah. Until you have like this really wide pool of everybody. Yeah. It takes incredible, uh, an incredible amount of work to get to that top the top 1% to top 10% because like there's so many smart people around there and people who have like years and years of experience and they dedicate their life towards being in that point. But let's say I have data as that triangle and I'm like halfway, let's make that assumption. And very close to it, I have another point and that's my marketing uh, like knowledge. Mm. And I'm also halfway on that. If you overlap those two, there's like a little triangle in between. And to be in the top of that little triangle, there are a lot less competitors but it's a it's two skills that really complement each other because you know like the information that a business need yeah. the com- the commercial stats that a business need how company how customers move through a customer journey which is the lifeblood of, of the yeah, company yeah. if you know those two things and you know how to visualize it and get like metrics in there that are actually valuable to a company that's gold and, yeah exactly and, and that combination of things is fantastic so if you ask me like hey if i would go to 16 year old me right now and like say hey what do you want to do i'll probably say don't do social cultural work. Like <laughs> maybe yeah. maybe take a gap year or something like that. Yeah. Um, or do do something that would even complement what you're doing even more. Um, but equally, like at that time, I was stubborn as hell. So but, I probably would have said, no, screw that. I'm <laughs> going to do it anyway. But here's the thing. It, it, it's understanding that sometimes the things that you do and the decision you make isn't wasted time. Mm. It's to join the dots. Yeah. You know, so for instance, with me in the, in the tech world, for example, I was working in print. Now, print 30 odd years ago went through a massive revolution in the fact that if you were if you were doing some artwork, you'd have to cut and paste it and stick it together. Mm-hmm. So you'd stick letters and headlines and text together. And then you would uh you would then shoot it on a camera 
which mm-hmm. goes to a negative. And then you take that negative and stick it on a plate, like a metal plate, expose the metal plate, which becomes the printing plate, which gets ink on it and prints on paper, right? Quite a long, laborious yeah. process. But almost overnight, it went where people went, well, if I have a computer and I press now, can it go straight to the printer and mm-hmm. then print the stuff out? At scale. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't, so you you kind of moved from all these processes and it disappeared overnight. Now you could argue, well, now you don't know anything about print because it's all changed and it's all Mm -hmm. gone. But what it did for me is it, it showed me that technology always changes Mm -hmm. and is always to begin to anticipate what's up ahead. So one of the things that I've seen now in the, in the tech world is there's this big change in the fact of there's coders that code lines and lines and lines and lines and lines of code, which makes sense. But now you've got two things. You've got the emergence of AI Mm -hmm. and you've got the emergence of no code tools. Mm -hmm. So it's like, for me, there's, there's, it's changed again. And it's, and I've always, I've always approached each sector that we work in and say, well, it might be the norm for now, but it might not be in five years Mm -hmm. because the print revolution just happened in literally, it was almost overnight. Mm-hmm. It's like within a year, these companies that were absolutely coining in were just gone mm. because the computer revolutionized everything yeah. from that score. So, you know, in the toll signable world, you know, it's also as much as it is about data, you've got to anticipate how that's going to change as well, how people interact. Mm. Oh, definitely. You know, because there's still some industries wanting wet signatures. Yep. Yep. Even though we have like incredibly secure versions of it that are actually, I would almost say more secure than... A wet Do signature. It in person. Yeah. A hundred percent. And so like, you know, that's, that's still, for me, that's still alien now. It's like, come on, we've surely got better now, but there's still industries that just won't revolutionize to that point quite yet. Mm. Um, so where next? What's the, what's the plan? Keep growing. Do you think you're going to be like creating data sets across multiple areas so you could, could become like a generalist across all of it and become a leader and building those dashboards or what do you, how do you see e- eventually it? if i can be really cheeky um eventually i want to end up somewhere in c-suite um like chief data officer anything yeah. in, in that range um okay. i think that's like helping people but also being b- busy with a business i think that really really is where i yeah r- really like to be um so the next steps would be to to become team lead um have a few people with me that i can help and support um and and then also looking at like what is the next big move strategic move for the business so move yeah. take maybe a step back from the operational and look more in like the the strategic side of things yeah yeah that that'd be the the area they actually go on yeah cool so from my perspective um in terms of tech and signatures and stuff like is there any stuff that we should be maybe not give your company secrets away but is there anything else that's innovative that's coming down the line that we've maybe not seen within the whole sign in and documentation world um I think that I'm I'm pretty pretty excited about is is, is a feature that and I and I don't know if competitors have this it could could be that this is a well known feature but um, non parallel signing um, so let's say you have um, you who needs to sign a document three other people who are involved with the contract and someone who has to oversee it normally if you send the contract it goes to you you sign it check it off cool then it goes to him he sees your signature on it he signs it tick it off goes to him, he signs it, puts the sig- ticket off, and then the one who oversees it gets like a copy, and then everybody gets a copy because everybody has signed. Yeah. However, if you're on a holiday and you don't want to be busy with, with work and you're gone for two weeks, everybody's stuck for two weeks. Nobody can do anything. Right, cool. Non-parallel signing sends that same contract to all parties individually. You can sign whenever you want. Um, and if these two people have signed already, you can already see those two signatures wow, great. no yeah. matter where, where in the sequence you are. And that's really nice because that, that speeds up a lot of processes. Yeah. Like still, if someone is gone for two weeks, okay, the process is maybe stuck for like two weeks so still. You're just waiting for one rather than yeah, the chain. Maybe you're gone for two weeks. Then this guy has like, I don't know, child is sick, so he can't like help for like three days. Then three days later, he sends the contract. Then it's weekend and two days again and on Monday yeah. he had like his, his annual leave so on Tuesday finally the whole thing is signed and then like all of a sudden we're a month month further where actually it could have been done in two weeks yeah. and if everybody's present it can be done in like five minutes wow yeah that, that, that sounds cool that that, sounds that's cool. really big so in terms of your decision making because we go back to your relationship and stuff like that obviously we 
made the parallel between data and decisions and and mm -hmm. and how you've found your life partner and whatever else do you do you use data in that way for other things like if you're buying products uh, do you find yourself going into data geek mode or is it just you i, I do you i do, do it work when i do like shopping in the shop they always have like the thing like it cost 21.3p per 100 grams or whatever i always yeah. look at that because i'm I, that's how i compare like whether it's a good deal or not yeah always um but other than that like I like to tinker with things. So um, we have a switch at home and like one of the buttons was broken. So I open it up and I follow like this like step-by-step -step guide to, fo to, to, to fix it and stuff like that. Yeah. Maybe that comes a little bit into like the, the nitty gritty, like just following processes and doing that. Um, but it's not that I look at my son's report card and be like, you're performing 23% <laughs> less than last period. Uh, kick it up. <laughs> no. Yeah, but you, you, you'll find, you know, you'll find that there's some aspects of your work. It does invade, you know, like, as I said, you know, you look at that price. So like with me, it's like when you're in a shop and it goes like, buy these two, get one free. And then you go, well, actually, if I just bought one, would I be better off? Mm -hmm. You know, I always, I think that way anyway. I think, well, is that a, is that a deal or is that not a deal? Or you mm -hmm. find out that actually they go buy this and whatever. And then you find, I think it's like when they have like two pastas, at like 350, let's say grams mm -hmm. in each one. And then you've got one, which is one kg and it's slightly less, or sometimes it's slightly more mm -hmm. and you figure it out. So I, I kind of look at data that way. Inadvertently. I mean, we, we had the same when we, um, when we bought a new car, we got a hybrid. Um, and I heard someone say hybrids are actually more expensive than petrol cars. I'm like, that's interesting. So I got my like notepad out, <laughs> checked, okay, so on battery, I can do so many miles. On petrol, I can do so many miles. And then just put the whole thing together. If I drive 500 miles, it will cost this. And if I drive that many miles, I could, and had the whole thing charted out and plotted out. I was like, okay, cool. We got hybrid. I'm cool with it. Because uh, I, now I know. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And it's obviously where you charge, isn't it? Because, you know, mm. if you're charging on the motorway service station now, it's quite comparative to that of uh, yeah. petrol now because they've whacked the prices yeah, up. Yeah, so. that's insane. Cool. MJ, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for taking some time to hang out with us on the sofa. It's been great. Is there any way that people can get reach out to you if they've got any questions or want to connect with your company? Um, Just connect with me on LinkedIn. LinkedIn? Um, yeah, yeah, LinkedIn is the best place to do that. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Thanks so much. Awesome. Brilliant. Thank you. Cheers. Hi, everybody. Thank you for listening to the Purpose People podcast. You can follow us online. You can like and subscribe to us on YouTube. You can follow us on Apple, Google, Amazon, and Spotify. And if you see any clips on our reels, which is on Instagram or Facebook, or even on TikTok, please give it a like, please give it a share, and please tell your friends. We'd love for you to take part in the Purpose People questionnaire. That is also through our website at creation.co.uk. And hopefully you you can find yourself living the life on purpose.